Awesome. Thanks, Johanna. There we go. Great. Perfect. Um, well, um, thanks to all of you for joining us today um, live from Morocco, although I'm broadcasting live from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, um, we're really excited to, to share with all of you an update um, from our delegation of um, young people and educators that are at um, COP22 in Morocco and um, to hear a little bit about what's going on there and also um, to really hear how um, the U.S. election has maybe impacted things and um, the direction of COP in general. Um, just to, to kick things off, my name is Kristen Poppleton. I'm the Director of Education for Climate Generation and Wills to Your Legacy. Um, we're a nonprofit that's based in the uh, Twin Cities of Minnesota and um, we have been focused on um, climate change education and outreach now for over 10 years and have um, been involved with taking folks to the international climate negotiations um, starting back at COP15 in Copenhagen. Um, this year we have a great group, an inter intergenerational group of um, folks representing climate generation and their own um, individual groups as well, which they can tell you more about. Um, and um, I think at this point I'm, I'm going to hand it over to them because they're really the focus of today and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And um, if you have any questions about um, what they have to say, hold on to them. You can write them in the chat box. Um, please keep your sound muted so we can hear them well. Um, the sound will kind of wave in and out um, during this sometimes because they're in Morocco <laughs> and it's um, uh, kind of a sketchy connection sometimes. So be patient and I know they have some photos to share and some insights. So we are really happy to have you all on today. Go ahead. Take it away, folks. Awesome. So should we go around first and uh, introduce ourselves and say like who we are, um, like and what we're doing here and what we're excited about? All right. Awesome. Absolutely. Yep. Who wants to start? Yeah. I'll start. I'm uh, Justin Johnson. I'm from uh, Minnesota as well, and uh, I'm here with the School of Environmental Studies. And I'm Isabel Watson. I'm also a senior at the School of Environmental Studies, and I intern with Climate Generation. Hello, my name is Siri Vigalki, and I am a member of the Climate Generation delegation here at COP22. Um, I was a member as well back at COP18 held in Doha. And yeah, I'm doing a number of things for Climate Generation here, um, which I guess we'll get into later. Hi, and last, this is Johanna. Um, I am uh, here also as part of the Climate Generation Delegation, and um, I'm also the uh, student fellow with the CLEAN Network, so the Climate Literacy and Energy um, <laughs> and forget, CLEAN Network, which may, maybe many of you guys know. Um, I'm a student in the Netherlands uh, in my master's, but have previously worked at Earth Day Network as the director of education. And um, where I ran into climate generation first, and we all worked together at COP21 in Paris to bring education to the table over there. So uh, who would like to start off talking about like their first impressions and what it's been like so far at COP? I can go, I guess. This is Siri speaking here. Um, so this year I have a couple of objectives um, that I'm trying to fulfill at COP22. Um, as a member of Climate Generation, I've been um, doing some writing, some blogging to <laughs> talk about the main points of the negotiations here, the agenda items as a follow-up to the Paris Agreement from last year. Um, I'm also trying to interview and talk to a lot of youth activists from around the world to get their climate stories. I did a little bit of that back at COP18, which was held in Doha. I talked to a lot of members of the Arab Youth Climate Movement. So I'm trying to 
collect their stories and do somewhat of like a four-year follow-up to um, these climate activists from the Arab world, which um, is really an interest of mine because back in 2012, it was right after the Arab Spring and um, it's, it's the political landscape of the Arab world has changed a lot in many ways and um, climate action has also changed because of that. Um, so I'm doing that, and I'm also involved with Youngo, which is the youth constituency here at um, um, COP. It's basically the um, gathering of youth who are here who want to work together to advance youth um, concerns and um, views within the negotiation text. So. I'm heading up the adaptation working group for Youngo, um, which basically means we're going to the negotiations that um, concern adaptation. Um, and we're following it. We're seeing which countries have similar ideas and similar values as we do as youth. And we're trying to lobby them and as well as the ones who don't have um, maybe as progressive ideas of, of adaptation as we as youth have. So we're following the negotiations and um, we're hoping to put out a policy paper as well as to um, work with um, the facilitators of the people or of the groups that do adaptation and to get youth voices heard within the negotiations. So that was quite a long description of what I do, but um, to answer the initial question, my um, kind of thoughts on how COP is going so far um, is that it's kind of <laughs> inescapable to, to um, or it's inescapable, the, the elections have really made a mark on the tone of the uh, negotiations this year. Um, we're in the fourth day right now, so in terms of actual concrete progress, we're still in the initial phases of the negotiations, um, but there's certainly a lot of question about how the future of climate action will proceed, given that the pres elected presidential um, figure right now in the U.S. has, in his campaign trail, um, pledged to pull out of the Paris Agreement. Um, I guess I'm also biased from the U.S., so it, I've, it's been on my mind a lot too, but I can certainly say that it's been on the minds of everybody else here. <laughs> Regardless, um, negotiators and civil, civil society members are still um, absolutely motivated to continue the work that's being done here and to make sure that this over 20-year process to get the Paris Agreement um, will not, you know, um, be in vain. So with that, I'll hand it off to um, Isabel, if you'd like to talk. Sure. Um, yeah, this is Isabel. Um, today was my first day and Justin's first day here, so we're still a bit like overwhelmed with everything in general um, and like how this works. And then, yeah, all the election stuff was thrown on top of just like being here, um, which like was hard to come into coming from a place of like being a bit hopeless about like what is like where do we stand now in this and like what's going to happen um that being said it was kind of like what i needed today was i don't think i had a, like a conversation that didn't mention the election which like constant reminder wasn't great but like everyone was like like people like although there's like a lot of grief here like people are like turning that into like motivation to like fight for this and like just because like our president changes doesn't change the facts about climate change and like doesn't change that like where it determines like create positive action here and like if it's going to be harder it's still going to happen it's kind of like what i was getting this way like all the hurt here like it's like they're using that to like for like motivation yeah i can add on to that a little bit with the big blow of the election results it definitely was a damper on the first day of cop but it coming around here there's a really something i haven't seen before i'm a little newer to the climate change field so 
it was really cool to see all of the people in the room all fighting for a common goal. And there are thousands of people here. So it's really cool to know that they're all going for the same thing for to help the climate. And that's something that at least lifted my mood a little bit when thinking about the election. So that's my take on the first day of COP. Nice. Uh, and this is Johanna. I guess to, since we're, we're talking about the uh, new president coming in, uh, I guess I, I will add to that as well. I think one of the things that this has made me realize, uh, in addition to the fact that there this is a supportive network of people that are here and we can kind of move together and turn this a, a bit of pain into something that uh, is actionable, um, is also the fact that there are this is climate change is something that intersects with so many other issues. Um, and I think people are here are thinking about that too. A climate change intersects with feminism and with migration and um, like all of these things are connected and how um, different nations and parties deal with all of those. Um, we need to kind of deal with them together. Um, so those are a couple of things that I was thinking about. Um, I should also mention that today was Young and Future Generations Day, which is particularly exciting and an important day um, for, I think, us at COP, uh, coming from an education and kind of youth perspective. Um, and it was really interesting to see young people here today and their perspective of, you know, wanting to be included in the negotiations because... A, they deserve to do so because they are the ones that are going to be most impacted, and B, because they do have solutions and they they do have um, uh, ideas that often are pushed to the wayside by um, the policymakers. Um, and so that was definitely a clear and strong message for me today. Uh, in addition to the fact that young people are doing awesome, incredible work. As you heard, Siri from Youngo has uh, been uh, following the adaptation uh, negotiations and is putting together a policy. Um, I've been working with Youngo as well on looking at the um, education, uh, if education has been integrated into their uh, nationally determined contributions, so NDCs. Um, and it's just great to see young people who um, are taking their skills and applying it to the UNFCCC and COP here uh, to kind of instigate change, regardless of um, maybe the impediments that are in our way. Um, Kristen, should I show you a couple of pictures that I took today? Yeah, that sounds great. Go ahead and share some photos out. Okay. So I have not edited any of these in the least. So I, can you guys see my screen? I'm going to hope so. Oh, wait. Yes. Um, okay. So this is actually at the, uh, what you see here is at the opening ceremony that happened on the first day. Let's see if we as you can see here, this is the, um, he is running, he's the cop president for this cop. And so, do you know what his title is in Morocco? I think he's the president. Yeah. He's, he's, well, there's a king who's kind of the primary political figure, but he's. Yeah. We think he's the president. <laughs> we'll get back to you on that one. Um, and then, oh, what's her name? She, she is the secretariat, and she has taken over, I believe, Christiana Figueres' role um, in the facilitation of the COP. Um, what I can show you now is this is at the um, U.S. Center working with um, the uh, U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit. So they were doing a, a showcase on how you can use this for policymakers, but also in different... Um, realms as well. Um, this uh, actually was a man who was talking about how important um, in Burkina Faso they find climate education at, and, uh, at a side event. This, oh, actually, I think this, oh, no, that isn't the one I'll show you guys. So this is the inside of the cop you can see here, just to give you a feel for 
what it's like to be actually in this space. So the first couple of days, it was actually pretty chilly, um, but it's warmed up a little bit now. Um, and then here today uh, it was an action. So often throughout the COP, you'll see actions. And there was actually one yesterday also um, on the U.S. election that was put on by youth, which I know Siri went to and maybe can um, talk a little bit about in a second. Um, this one was done today, and it was really about um, providing youth the space to have um, influence upon uh, the negotiations. So those are just a couple of uh, pictures that I've pulled together throughout the day and the past couple of days uh, to give you a sense and feeling for what's going on and what it actually looks like here. Siri, do you want to say, Johanna, or, or could one of you um, talk a little bit about, I know when I was there last year, this idea of these actions was a new thing for me, like that they're sanctioned, but they're people standing up, like, could you talk a little bit more, explain what that is, if there are folks on the call that don't know what that's about? Sure. Siri, do you want to take that question? Um, sure. So um, these different constituency groups that I referred to earlier, um, Youngo being the youth group, um, there's also a women and gender group, an indigenous, indigenous group, and um, several others, oftentimes organized nonviolent direct action events to raise awareness to um, either particular issues within the negotiations or the fact that a country is blocking um, progress um, for, you know, many reasons. Um, so yeah, they're, you know, like <laughs> any other nonviolent direct action um, that one has in um, any kind of sphere. But here at the UN, um, there are certain measures that have to be followed. It can't be, um, I guess, incredibly disruptive. Um, there's pretty tight security around here. So if the action were to um, get too sizable or in the viewpoint of the security guards cause any kind of um, security hazard, they will shut it down. However, it is fairly normal um, to have um, youth in particular organize events, organize actions to raise awareness. And um, they can take many different forms. There was one yesterday in response to the presidential election outcome where U.S. youth wrote a list of demands um, for the future president. And given the outcome, um, they kind of crossed off president on the top of this um, long sheet of paper that they had that listed the demands and wrote um, people because um, just given Donald Trump's track record um, against climate action, they decided that it's really up to everybody now to hold the government, to hold the U.S. accountable for a strong climate action. So the photo that um, was just shown a bit ago, um, where youth are holding signs. Um, that's another example of an action. Um, in this particular case, youth are um, advocating for greater um, autonomy within the COP sphere to um, organize our own events and to really have a more empowered position to be able to say our viewpoints. Um, as was mentioned, today was Young and Future Generations Day. Um, however, there was some um, kind of sense of disappointment on how that was handled because um, the Secretariat, or the the um, basically the body, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change um, uh, group, kind of approached Youngo yesterday and said, "All right, tomorrow is Young and Future Generation Day." here's the schedule, here's what's going to happen. And many of you were like, wait, whoa, hold up. Um, shouldn't we be organizing this if we're the youth activists, if we're the, the young people here at COP? Um, it, it felt um, like the Secretariat was kind of um, impeding on our autonomy as a group here at COP. So that was the reason for that action. 
Yeah, and I guess um, to add just a little bit to Siri, uh, Siri's description of the actions, one of the big reasons that they're done also is because they are just such um, often a very beautiful and artistic portrayal of um, of what is going on because this can be a very particular uh, process where you know every comma and every period means something, and so to have some. Um, more to have these uh, people who are coming in and are about to go into the negotiations go by these groups that are putting on these um, kind of emotional uh, portrayals of what is going actually happening in those negotiation rooms um, can really have a significant effect on the uh, policymakers that are going uh, past them as well as kind of allow for the media and I think um, the public more generally to connect with this process to a certain extent and see, see what is happening in a different way. Uh, so I guess I think the best thing to do now, if but Kristen, correct me if I'm wrong, is to maybe ask if there are questions about what we've been up to or like what we're expecting. Yeah, um, I have some written down myself if other people don't, but feel free to either write in the chat box or um, unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone under the word audio. Um, if you have a question, does anyone out there have one? No questions? All right, well, I'm going to ask one since no one else is so far, and we'll see if any kind of come out. I, I see when I'm looking here actually a number of teachers that are on the call today, and um, I'm wondering how um, just so far like with meeting folks, um, um, in this eCongo group, which is focusing on education and, and talking with folks in Yungo, how are you seeing other or hearing about other ways that climate change is being taught in other countries, like other models that are intriguing or other, um, I don't know, just like how it's being instituted in other countries? I guess I can take that question a little bit. Um, I think it's been interesting to look at the yeah the different types of avenues that you can follow for climate education and what people are doing. Um, I've been you know connecting with the scouts that are very um, very focused on non formal education around uh, around the world, and so when they're looking, for instance, at what different countries are doing on education, they they want to look at okay what what's actually happening on the non formal side and um, found that very few of the countries, at least in their NDCs, have included anything about non-formal education. Um, but then there are also um, other groups that are very focused on innovation and um, venture capitalism, uh, which is very different than, I think, uh, what other groups may focus on in, um, you know, teaching young people how to organize themselves. And I, I think there are there are connections there, but um, we, I've seen a lot of distinctions and differences, that, um, which has been very interesting to see that dialogue play out. Um, I ran into a woman today who is uh, based out of Costa Rica, and she is, has been really interested in, okay, how do I take what I've learned? She studied in Toronto first, like how do I take what I've learned there about climate change and then apply it to this new place and um, still give the uh, give the community context for um, what a energy transition looks like. So she was really grappling with that issue and was looking for at, at COP looking for other people who are in the climate education world and space for uh, advice and understanding. So I thought that was really interesting and something that could be. Um, as eCongo, which is this new group, um, as it grows, can um, actually facilitate that type of discussion and give people like this ideas of uh, different ways to educate um, people on climate change. And 
Kristen, do some people on the phone know what Econgo is, or should I describe that in a little bit more depth? Uh, you could describe it a little bit. There's some questions that came in, too, when you're done I'm, um, in the chat box that you might want to check out. So, yeah, go for it. Um, so Econgo is the Education, Communication, and Outreach um, and NGO affiliation group, very similar to what Syria was talking about with Youngo. And so it was just started this year, and we're trying to um, – make sure that education is included within um, the within the negotiations because obviously we feel that that is um, to a certain extent the basis of what we need in order to reach ad the adapt and adaptation and mitigation uh, goals. So that's something that's growing and expanding right now and we're trying to see what will happen in the future. But let's take a look at the questions. Um, have you had a chance to talk with others from other countries? Are there methods for moving forward aligned with yours? Does anyone want to take that? Yeah, you, so you heard a cool idea from yeah. another country? Awesome. Uh, from walking around CAP today, I tried to go to as many different booths as I could, and one country that I thought was really cool for me was India, or yeah, India is bad. But anyway, they did a great job. One of the ideas was uh, smart cities, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but they had about 60, 60 cities so far that have been invested in to turn them into smart cities, and that means changing over their electricity to hopefully solar and green energy, and then as well as taking trying to take cars off the road by implementing different ways of transit, such as buses and light rails. And I thought that was really interesting, especially since India is still developing and not nearly as far along as some other countries and that they're still trying to implement these, these more expensive projects into a growing city. There's about 100 different cities they've chosen for this so far, and so 60 have been worked on. That was the idea I heard today. Yeah, I guess to kind of try and answer your question, I think, yes. I think a lot of the, um, we are, I went to a session on like fossil fuels today and I think that they, there was, the panel was um, six people from countries primarily like as, like similar to the US in terms of development. Um, and they were all talking about ways that like, I mean, we have like the same goal that we're going for because it's about like, maintaining like a habitable habitable planet um so they were talking about like strategies that they're all like have been proven to work everywhere but obviously not every strategy is that way but there are definitely like methods that people are trying to talk to each other about to achieve like the same goal um i can say something um concerning that um I, as I mentioned, I have been interviewing some youth activists um, from different countries, and I spoke to a woman, um, young woman, two days ago from Lebanon. And um, in terms of methods for um, climate education, or just even for <laughs> addressing climate change, um, it sounds like they're doing a lot of the same things we're doing as young activists in the U.S. Um, she just started the chapter of the Arab Youth Climate Movement in Beirut um, and has been working on um, a number of different campaigns, um, mainly out of Beirut, to uh, raise, raise awareness about climate impacts in the Middle East and in the Levant specifically. Um, she's been trying to build the capacity of this group so that they can reach out to even more groups. Um, she told me that all five members of the board are women, which is really cool for awesome. me to hear. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think it's, yeah, they're, they're moving forward in a very similar way. Um, but just given kind of the technical realities of um, organizing in Beirut, um, they're also using different approaches. Um, They've talked a lot to um, 
women in specific in women organizations about um, climate change and the adverse impacts that um, women in the Middle East in, uh, feel from climate change. Um, just because women are typically the ones who are reliant on resources and um, because now temperatures are changing, they're fluctuating much more rapidly. Um, the agricultural system of the Middle East is really um, changing as well. Um, so women in Lebanon are experiencing hardships that they have never experienced before. So they're trying to provide resources, educate women as well as young people, um, and um, approach climate education in kind of that holistic perspective, which, you know, in a way is often, it sounds like what we do as well in the U.S. Yeah. So it says, what is the emotional and substantive response among the people of all ages from all countries to the fact that the U.S. has elected a climate denier as president who says that uh, he is appointing a climate denier to the head of our EPA? Anyone? I, I guess um, one of the things I could say is um, there are definitely emotional responses to um, this in particular. And even just watching, I, I watch the elections alongside, um, I think, four New Zealanders. And they were almost, they were so very supportive of us as we were going through this, but also were feeling it themselves as well because they recognize that um, there were ramifications uh, beyond just the United States. They were willing to give us maybe an apartment over in New Zealand to uh, escape the madness, but uh, I think they also realized that we, also, we need to be home and we also need to work on this to make sure that climate denialism does not take over um, the U.S. and become as pervasive as it once was. Um, I thought another interesting thing that was brought up, and Siri, you may have seen this in the U.S. youth. Mm -hmm. um, they were talking about the fact that it, it was a, the U.S. youth were trying to put together a press conference about the fact that this did happen. Um, and then one really interesting comment that was made was, you know, um, the U.S. has like very significant implications, but we also can't forget to recognize that there are... Um, other nations that have been going through much worse and are already impacted in such a significant way, um, is it right for us to focus so greatly on the United States? So I thought that was just an interesting thing to ponder and think about as we move forward. Um, yeah, from a youth perspective, I think many of the people here from around the world are just as upset as U.S. youth are by the results, um, maybe even a little more so. Well, I don't know. I think equally because um, just given the reality that the U.S. is the global hegemonic power currently, um, whatever actions the U.S. takes um, will be resounding not only just politically but um, emotionally here at COP. Um, at the same time, I think there's this resolve to just continue the fight. Um, and I think people realize that, you know, Donald Trump is one man. And while he may attempt to dismantle national and international climate action, um, the, the fight will continue. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change will still exist. And the Paris Agreement will not, um, you know, spontaneously burst into flame. It'll continue to live on. <laughs> so, um, yeah, people are certainly upset, um, but they're willing to continue the fight. And I mean, not only willing, but they see it as necessary. Um, so I think we can only speculate now what will happen, um, given that Trump has been so cavalier in the way he talks about climate change, but has never actually given us like concrete policies. Um, he's 
talked about pulling out of the Paris Agreement, um, but because the U.S. is currently a signatory, we can't actually get out of it until um, another three years from now. Um, however, there are ways around that. Technically, the U.S. could actually pull out of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, and certainly, even if we were just as, even if we continued to be a signatory, we could not follow up on the Paris Agreement just because the UN has no actual um, authority in terms of implementing its policies. <laughs> There's no United Nations global army that will make the U.S. cut down on fossil fuel emissions. Um, so yeah, there's really a lot of concern, but right now we can only speculate and then continue to fight for really strong climate action nationally in the future. Um, another question that was given was, is climate change being taught in schools in other countries? In what grades do they begin? Um, does anyone want to answer that? Does anyone run into that in there? You know, you guys have been here for a day. No. Okay. <laughs> this might be. So, um, I guess as I was mentioning before, uh, I've been working with the Action for Climate Empowerment group from Youngo, and it's been really interesting to see um, where the nationally determined uh, contributions, uh, if they do include education, where. They, um, in what states they are, or excuse me, in what uh, parties they are. Uh, for instance, Europe, Australia, the United States, uh, India, and Brazil, so pretty major economies, none of them have any mention of um, education in their NDC. But then looking at places like Kiribati um, and um, Algeria, um, Seychelles, and um, quite a few uh, small island states and African states have um, a pretty relatively um, integrated action plans for education in their NDC, which I was really surprised by that that was, that was where they had focus, um, is on this public awareness, engagement, and capacity building. They saw that as really key to what they were trying to accomplish in their uh, in their countries. Um, I'll also add that historically, education has not been a big priority within the negotiations. Um, although it was part of the original um, document to come out of the 1992 Real Earth Summit, um, Article 6 was kind of the original um, like environmental education component of um, like sustainable development or the Convention on Climate Change. Um, but I think in the last 20 years, it's just not been a big emphasis of countries here at COP. Um, but the Paris Agreement has changed that. And um, although there's still a lot of work to be done, um, it at least is becoming more of a priority for a lot of countries. For the two of you guys that just got here, um, do you guys have any ideas of like what you want to do in the next week or so that you're here? Oh, <laughs> and also um, to add to that, I was thinking it might be interesting for people just to hear how you prepared you SES students to come here in the first place. Like, like a background on like SES is a public school in Minnesota, and I don't know how did you prepare to to get here in the first place? Okay. Yeah. So the preparation was, it was, we had a very broad range of what we could do to prepare. So for, for us, we were given a list of websites that we could go to, such as uh, the UN COP website that lays out for us modules for, that we can go through and read. I think there, there, in total there's six of them. And you can take those courses and then get a little certificate that shows you went through them. And that, that was great. I did a few of those modules and I got a lot of information out of them. And then we, there's also on top of that PowerPoints uh, on the Prezi website that you can go to and 
get more information on what happened in the Paris Agreement, what happened um, in the last few cops, and can't see other information. But mostly just websites that we can go to to look up. This was um, usually the SES students that go to COP, they've been doing this since a few years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, usually there's a class, but this year we didn't get to have a class on it, so we were yeah. kind of... Independent learning, yeah. Yeah. And then we also, um, because we do have kind of a unique school, um, we are doing a presentation at the American School of Marrakesh tomorrow for the... Um, Global Issues Network conference. Um, just and there's gonna be a ton of school, a ton of schools there, kind of talking about like how they're doing this type of stuff in their own school, um, and presenting to schools who like want to get involved but don't really know where to start or like are very new to this. So that's like a cool thing to be a part of is like spreading that education piece of it, even if it's not formal. But like, what can school clubs do and stuff like that? Awesome. Um, it looks like Jen had asked, what has been your most powerful or memorable experience to date at COP? And I know for some of you, you just arrived, and um, but even in the first day, what was like, what struck you first? And then maybe the other folks, it's kind of a nice way to um, end things too. So, And then she also said, what has been the most challenging, which is actually a really good question too. Um, okay, I'll go. This is Siri again. Um, I guess the most powerful experience for me is always meeting other youth from around the world and hearing their climate stories at home. I was so inspired by this woman from um, Lebanon and just hearing her story of creating a chapter of the Arab Youth Climate Movement in Beirut and hearing that all five of the board members are women. Um, that was the most powerful experience for me thus far. And the most challenging, I guess, um, I mean, yeah, definitely the presidential outcome, but also I think the kind of energy here at COP can be really intense. Um, it's a very bureaucratic space. It's amazing that it's such a diverse and global community that's here, but um, sometimes it's, it's just overly professional and bureaucratic and people are always on their laptops or on their cell phones and I find myself checking my email, you know, every three minutes. <laughs> and I guess um, it's hard just to feel surrounded by so many people and then to feel very isolated sometimes too. But then you have these interactions with people from, you know, Liberia or Taiwan, and you hear their story and you meet them, and um, it's it's really a great experience. Yes, I can answer from day one. Um, yeah, mine's pretty similar in terms of like powerful is like just like all the people that you're gonna talk to here, like from all over doing all different things, and like hearing why they're here is like really powerful to just like know why all these people are here yeah like they all have diverse backgrounds but they're all here like for the same goal um challenging it's definitely like just like i don't know my first day like it's like overwhelming at the beginning because i didn't know what to expect and then also with the election stuff so, like just those two things combined was like hard right at the beginning and i didn't know anything um <laughs> yeah Right. Um, this is Justin again. My most memorable moment from day one was talking to a man named Tom, who was amazing to talk to. The reason he was memorable is because he made a, a bobber or that goes out in the ocean, and then there's about 4,000 of them right now, and it can measure pH levels, nitrogen, nitrogen levels, and CO2 levels. But that was cool, but what, his, what made him memorable is his passion. He really had just great passion what he was doing and he believed in it and it gave gave me at least a lot of hope for the future or that there's people out there like this that are creating great things that that i i can't i'm not a inventor but to know people are really gives you hope 
And then the challenge, my biggest challenge was like the rest of them is just emotionally, it, you go on a, it's just, it's a whirlwind of emotions. You go from one conference and you're super excited because you feel hope from that conference and then you go to another conference and it's very scary st statistics that just kind of bring you down and it's just handling all of that and then the election on top of that, which makes it even more challenging at that point. That's my overview. Most memorable, these are very hard questions, um, but important ones to reflect upon our time here so far. Um, I think actually something that was really memorable to me was at, outside of the cop walls, but at dinner yesterday with a band of um, Canadians that have been working on these issues for a very long time. And them talking about, okay, well, in the context of the um, negotiations and, you know, administrations coming in and out, like, it takes us a really long time, but we are resilient when things may not go the way that we want them to, I think, like Trump. And that, obviously, I have lived my entire life in a pretty um, divided, uh, politically divided uh, time. And to recognize that Still, it's hard, but things can get done, um, was, I think, something important for me to learn while I was here. Um, most challenging, I think, for me is there's a lot that's going on here, and there are a lot of people doing incredible, incredible work. And so it's almost like, uh, am I contributing enough? Am I giving my all? Is this, could, what else could I be doing right now that would have even more impact? Because this is high stakes. Um, so I think that like coming to grips with like how you take care of yourself and also put as much as you can into the time that you have here. So we have about 10 or um, I don't know how much time left we want, Kristen. Yeah, I'm sorry. The sound had cut out for a minute for me. Um, that's why I was radio silence. Um, no, unless there's other questions for folks, we can let you guys go. I know it's later on your end of the day, of course. Um, but thank you so much for taking time out from the buzz to talk with us. And it's been really nice hearing your voices and hearing your resolve to move forward and that you're with showing the world that there's a lot of us that are dedicated to working on this. So thanks for sharing. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you guys. Your interest. All right, take care and soak it up. Woo! Woo! Bye. All right. Good work, guys. Nice. Team high five! Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thanks for including me on that call. And don't, don't forget to take that group photo. Oh, we just, we just did. I sent it to Katie. Yay.